morning, church. I hope you guys are all enjoying the uh, service so far this morning. Uh, my name is Rick Romano, and I serve and lead the campus ministry in the church. And uh, as you guys heard, we're doing a new series on April Fools, okay? You got, a, you got a donkey up there, if you can see that. We had a fierce debate in our staff meeting if we should put a donkey in the graphic. And uh, Megan and I won, so we threw a donkey up there. But, uh, but anyways, you know, the Bible in a myriad of different ways describes how we can be foolish with the words that we say and with the actions that we take. And, uh, you know, Chris Zillman wrote this series, I think in a large part because he just has so many examples from his life. And so you guys will get to hear those examples in the coming weeks. But uh, this whole month is going to be dedicated to the way that a fool thinks and the way that a fool operates, all in hopes that we can be anything but foolish. Amen? Amen. And uh, the thing about being foolish is, None of us know when we're being a fool, right? F fools go on acting and doing foolish things because they never stop and ask the question, is this foolish? And so the first step to overcoming foolishness is to figure out whether or not you're being a fool, okay? And so the title for the lesson today is Self-Unaware. Self-Unaware. You know, the thing about it is like when we lose our self-awareness, we lose the ability to accurately assess ourselves in everyday life. We don't have like a good understanding of how we come across to other people. And that's, that's just not a good place to be, right? Like we get into trouble when we're, when we're in that kind of mindset. And the thing about it is like we all have moments in our lives where we lack self-awareness. Like we all do. None of us is immune. And, and it's these moments where we act and we say in the, the most foolish, foolish things, Okay. You know, I, I, like I said earlier, I'm a campus minister, and so the first couple weeks of the semester when school starts in the fall, those are like the craziest part of my job, okay? It's, it's the most busy, it's the most hectic, and um, you know, last fall, the first day of school, you know, I, I got to be on campus by 9 a.m. because we have this table that we set up where we're going to go share our faith and see if people want to come out to our group. And so I'm getting ready for all that. So I'm up at 7 a.m., you know, I, I read my Bible, I pray, I, I eat breakfast, take a quick shower, I'm out the door, it's kind of like frantic, you know, like I'm, I'm running to campus, and uh, I got to take all this tabling stuff, because there's, you know, to set up a table on campus, you've got like tablecloth, candy, you know, you got banners, you got all that stuff, right? And so I, I'm carrying all this stuff to campus, it's like 9.30, and I just, I felt off all day. Okay, I felt weird. I felt kind of awkward. I was like, no, I brushed my teeth. I'm good. No, I, uh, I took a shower. I'm good to go. So I just keep going, right? And I'm setting up this table, and I look down, and I realize that I've got two different shoes on. Okay? I've got, I've got, they're both black in my defense, okay? Two black shoes. But I've got a Nike shoe on that's got about an inch heel on it, so I'm a little taller. And then on my left, I've got this Adidas shoe. That's got, got no, no height on it, right? And so, like, I'm walking around. I'm, like, slightly taller on my right foot. That's why I felt weird all day and uh, all morning. And all I had on was, like, a T-shirt, some shorts, and shoes. And so, like, it's, it's probably pretty noticeable that I've got on two different shoes, right? And, and so I had to call my roommate up, Colin, at 930. I'm like, hey, Colin, can you, can you go up to my room and grab my, my left Nike shoe? And he's like you want me to grab both of your shoes? And I'm like, well, I, I got one of them on, you know? Um, I'm wearing two different shoes right now, and he just busts out laughing. I gotta deal with that. And so, the reason I'm telling you this story right now is because, like, when we're unaware of how we come across, when we're unaware of ourselves, we're fools. Like, we look like idiots, you know what I mean? Like, and, and then we get hindsight after the fact of being foolish, and we usually learn some lessons in that moment. But, I don't know about you, but I would like not to make, you know, myself look like that. You know what I'm saying? I would like not to be a fool in the moment. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to focus on a few examples that from, come from Scripture about how, how we can refrain from being foolish and how we instead can be wise, okay? And how we can be self-aware of ourselves and how we come across. Amen? Amen. All right. So the fa first way for us to be self-aware is we got to be desperate for it. We got to be desperate to be self-aware. You know, uh, my dad always used to say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink, right? We got to be a horse that's willing to drink when it comes to, like, being self-aware of ourselves, okay? 
Um, if we're not, if we don't have like a desire to be self-aware, then God's not going to be able to help us. People aren't going to be able to help us. Like we're going to be stuck kind of where we're at. So first things first, we got to be desperate to be self-aware. And um, it's kind of cool, Stacy shared this scripture. We're going to go to Psalm 139, start in verse 23 through 24. Hopefully you guys can kind of see that up there. Um, but Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And I just, I love this scripture because King David wrote it. And I mean, this guy just had to have had a strong desire to understand himself. To understand how maybe he was offending God. You know, he, he even desired that God would like test him to see what was revealed in his heart. I don't know if I'd be praying that prayer, right? But like David's like, I want to know what's in there. He knew that God understood the good and the bad and the ugly of what was inside of him. And David wasn't cool with God just knowing that and him not knowing that. He wanted to understand it as well. And he wanted to know it so badly so that he could do some course correction, potentially, in his heart for God. Let's, uh, let's look at Proverbs 4 now. So we're going to be spending most of the day in Proverbs, so you can just flip there but, and stay there. But Proverbs 4, verses 7 through 8. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. And man, do you guys see the way that the writer of Proverbs here wants you to desire to get wisdom? Like, he's saying that it's worth, it's worth all the wealth you have. Everything you own, throw at it, if that's what it takes for you to get wisdom. He's saying no sacrifice is too great. And uh, I love how he starts comparing wisdom to a woman, you know, a woman who, who you cherish, who you pursue, who you go after. I think, I don't know, I think when I read this as a guy, I think he's kind of saying like, hey men, the way that you pursue a woman who you're crazy about, that's how you should be pursuing wisdom. That's how you should pursue understanding like in this frantic, unapologetic way, right, that men can some, sometimes be when they pursue women. You know, when I decided that I liked my now fiance Adriana, like I'm telling you guys, I pursued her like a lion pursues a gazelle. Okay, like, like I found out that alpacas were her favorite animal. And so what did I do for a date? I, I found this like alpaca farm up in Erie. And uh, we went there and she got to like pet the baby, baby alpacas and like feed them. And like we, we ended up buying this like, uh, these little like stuffed animal bears that were made out of alpaca fur. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it was awesome. I got, I got so much input from Greg, from Chris, from different men in my life so that I wouldn't mess it up. You know what I mean? Like, guys tend to mess this kind of stuff up. We need some input. We need some help. Um, you know, Adriana really likes to prank people. She's, she's kind of a fiend in that way. And uh, so one day after Bible talk, we're sitting there, and she's like, what if we just, like, pranked one of the other Bible talks? And, you know, me as the minister, like, it's never a good idea for me to get involved in pranks because, <laughs> because no matter, even if I barely participate, everybody wants to destroy me. You know what I'm saying? Like, people are out, they don't care about anybody else, they're like, we gotta destroy Rick, we gotta get him. And so I was, like, a little hesitant, I was like, I don't know about this, but because Adriana wanted to do it, we went and pranked another Bible talk. And so, next thing I know, it's 9 p.m., we're driving up to Boulder, and we prank the CU Bible talk where they're having Bible talk, all right? And as they're having Bible talk, we're taking their tires off their car and we're hiding. Yeah, we, yeah, you know, when Adriana pranks you, you're gonna, you better watch out. So we're hiding their tires. We're putting cinder blocks where the tires should go. And next thing I know, I'm almost getting in a physical fist fight with one of my best friends, Turner, who leads the ministry up there because he was so frustrated with me. But... I would have never done that on my own, but I liked Adriana, you know what I mean? So the chips were, on, were out of the bag. But I'm telling you guys, like, when I was pursuing Adriana, like, it was like I had the tiger. Like, I was, I was doing whatever it took to impress her, to make her feel special. Like, I was desperate. And we should always be desperate like this 
when it comes to being self-aware of ourselves, all right? You guys, when a person lacks self-awareness, and we've all been there, it's, it's like that person kind of has bad breath. You know, like, every time that person opens their mouth, everybody has to pay around them because of their bad breath. And like, you know, when, when somebody has bad breath and they're talking to you, you're like, do I tell them? Do I offer them gum? Are they going to get offended? Like, they're, they're needing to deal with all this, and the person who has bad breath has no idea what's going on. That's how it is when we're unaware of ourselves. We just got to save people the trouble, right, and be desperate to be self-aware. No one here has a complete picture of their own character and how they come across to the people around them. None of us do. The fool is comfortable with being unaware, but a wise person is desperate to be self-aware. Amen? Once we have that legitimate desire to pursue and run after self-awareness, we can move on to the next way of becoming self-aware, and that's just to keep wise company, all right? It's to keep wise company. Hopefully the black font is kind of helping us a little bit. We're going to buy some, we're going to buy some, uh, what, are they, what are they called, screens? That we're going to put hopefully here and here, so bear with us on that. But um, check out Proverbs 27, verse 6, 27, verse 6. Um, it says, wounds of a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. You know, we live in a world where if somebody disagrees with you or if somebody opposes you or tells you something you don't want to hear, like, it's socially acceptable to just kind of, like, block that person out of your life, to, to not have anything to do with them. Like, you can label them as toxic or whatever, and you're kind of good to go, right? Like, people, people do that all the time nowadays, especially on, like, social media and stuff. Um, but wisdom says that if somebody is willing to talk to you, like, face-to-face -face in person— that something is off with you, that something perhaps might need to change in your character, like you can trust that. That is a real friend. That is somebody who cares enough about you to be honest with you. Amen. Wisdom also says that you should be wary of somebody who, who always agrees with you. Somebody who's kind of like a, West, a, a yes man, somebody who always tells you what you want to hear. You know, I think this person will allow you to settle with yourself instead of challenge you, challenging you to grow. And scripture is saying here, like, like, this could be your enemy. Somebody who just tells you what you want to hear. Wounds from a friend bring about self-awareness. Let's read Proverbs 13.20. Proverbs 13.20. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. And, uh, man, this is, a, this is a crazy proverb. What kind of company do you keep in your life? Do you walk through your life with people who, who make excuses, with people who, who tell you what you want to hear, with those who maybe don't prioritize a godly lifestyle? Or are you walking with people who are wise, those who carefully live their life to honor Christ, those who hunger to be the best that they can be for Jesus Christ? When we keep wise company, it, I'm telling you, it becomes very hard for us to be unaware of ourselves. Because that person's going to tell you when you're, off, when you're off a little bit. That person's going to say something when you come across in a way that's not cool, right? Like, it becomes hard to be unaware of ourselves. I'm 29 years old now, and uh, man, I, it, it just feels like Jesus has beaten it into me time and time again that, you know, I've got some issues, okay? Like, like I... I kind of have a tendency to say things that are pretty risque and, uh, you know, inappropriate at times. And I've got guys in my life who, like, are like, Rick, reel it in, you know, like, chill out. You know, I can be way too assertive and controlling with things that I care about. And, you know, I've got, I've got different character traits like that. And so I, I've, I'm finally learning, like, man, I really need people in my life in order to kind of, like, combat those negative parts of my character that can come up. I need people to be honest with me about my life. I think about guys like Greg Bickle, who, who helps me to be a good leader in the campus ministry, who helps me to be a good fiance to Adriana so that I don't drive her nuts. You know, I need guys like Chris Zillman to, to wake me up when I'm being controlling and put me in my place a little bit. I need Adriana to help me see when I'm being really off-putting to other people. Like, she, she kind of helps me. She's like, Rick? You're, there's a few people here that think that's funny, but everybody else is like, what are you saying right now? 
I need Colin Shootman to help me when I'm being a little too hard on the guys in the ministry and, and even when I'm being a little bit too soft on those guys as well. You know, I've just come to the conclusion that I've got some strengths that I'm proud of, that I'm fired up about, that I love about myself, but man, I've got some like really negative aspects to my character as well, you know? And so I got to keep White's company or else, man, I'm not going to have any friends, you know what I mean? Like if, if I keep up with that. Um, Guys, we all need this. Like, we need wise company. We need people around us who are honest with us, who kind of who help us to be the best that we can be. Um, who are your people in the church, in this room? Who are the people right here who can be honest with you? You know, who aren't afraid to wound you, to tell you the truth? Do you have people like this? And if, if you don't have some of these people, are you willing to go seek them out and find those people? You know, one of the things that I love about our church is, is that we believe in, like, peer-to-peer discipling. We believe in having these one-another relationships where we sharpen each other with God's word, where we take time to pray together, share our faith, and serve other people. When you have these biblical one-another relationships, like, it's, I'm telling you, it's really easy to be self-aware, to follow in Jesus' footsteps, because that's, that's literally the goal of these discipling times, right? You guys, can I, can I say something hard real quick? Can I be real? Okay. If you're not getting discipling, like, on a consistent basis, you're a fool. If you don't have discipling consistently, like, you're going to have a lot of blind spots in your character. It's foolish when we don't have, when we don't, fight to have those one another relationships in our lives where we can be where we can be guided by God's word where we can be challenged by other people and where we can be encouraged as well like we need that also those who are self-aware they walk with the wise but those who are not self-aware they, they walk by themselves they walk alone church each of us ought to prioritize Walking with the wise. Amen? Amen. Can we do that? <clears throat> cool. Okay, so if we're desperate to be self-aware, then um, we're going to be willing to keep wise company. And if we keep wise company, then and only then can we ask for advice, seek advice. Okay? Um, so the third step we're going to talk about is seeking advice. Let's read Proverbs 12, verse 15. Proverbs 12, 15. Maybe you can see it on there. Maybe not, because it's near impossible to see up there. Um, The way of a fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Woo! You know, here's some of the things that I've thought of when when I'm wrestling with whether or not I should get advice about something. I can come up with this, this course of action in my mind that seems totally right, flawless, like, I've thought about it from every dimension, every angle. I've thought through this situation completely. So I don't need to get advice. Besides, nobody else knows the details of my life like I do, right? Like these are the things that I tell myself when I don't want to seek advice, right? But this this proverb is saying here that this is the mentality of a fool. But the wise are those who listen to advice. They seek it out. They consider it carefully. And then there's Proverbs 12, verse 1. Same chapter, just verse 1. Is that on there? We don't have that one. That's my bad. Okay. Proverbs 12, 1, flipping your Bibles. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Woo! You know, I've actually gotten this one a lot, believe it or not, in my time. When we seek advice about our lives... We're going to get correction on our plans and on our actions. Like, we're kind of inviting it. You know what I mean? Like, we're doing that so that people can correct our thinking or correct our perspective. But I think there's this feeling that we can all get it from time to time where, you know, we're we're like sitting down with somebody. They might be dishing out a little bit of correction because they want to help us. And we feel that feeling welling up inside of us, right, where, man, we just hate that correction. Like, we have a plan. We know what we want to do. We know how we want to get there. And... I know that feeling well. I have felt that feeling many times. But I need to hear this scripture when I'm in that frame of mind. I need to know that I'm being stupid. (laughs) You know, I need to know that this is like a stupid way to think. And when we're all in this frame of mind, we're being stupid too. 
That's not to say that this other person's advice isn't flawless. I'm not saying that. Like, I'm not saying you do exactly what they say. But man, when we're feeling that defensiveness, when those walls come up, that is, that's a stupid place to be, okay? When we swallow our pride and seek advice with our lives from wise and godly people, like, there's not going to be any room for self awareness. Like, we're going to have a very honest perspective of where we are because people are going to be correcting how we're thinking. They're going to be correcting what kind of course of action we want to take. And, uh, you know, he's not here today, but I've got to lift up Justice Zillman for a sec. I mean, I mean this spring, this, this guy has been so eager to get input and advice on his life. Like, it's been wild. He's, he's asked for feedback about, he's working like 40 hours a week, and then he's also, you know, serving in the ministry. He's asked for so much input on how to juggle those two things well. How to be really successful at work, how to be really like serving in the ministry. Like, he's asked for a lot of feedback on how to schedule. He's asked me for a ton of advice with how he comes across to other people. You know, uh, a lot of us know Justice. He, he also has what I have. He says some wild, out-of-pocket things, okay? And, uh, and he's gotten so much input to come across in a way where he can still be funny, but also not be off-putting to everybody else in the group, right? He sought advice with how to build up and strengthen the men in the ministry. He's gotten a ton of input with, like, building healthy and spiritual relationships with the sisters that are pure and awesome. Um, whenever he, he writes a Bible talk, he'll send me the whole thing. What do you think about this? Like, what can I change? He's like opening himself up to feedback, you know? He gets advice from me. He gets advice from Alex. He gets advice from the youngest guy in the ministry, from the oldest guy in the ministry. He's got in, input from a lot of you in this crowd, okay? He's just got this special humility and eagerness when it comes to getting advice. And I think because of that, I think Justice is probably the most self-aware guy in our ministry right now. I think he's gotten a lot of correction along with it, but he's also obtained a very accurate sense of his strengths and his weaknesses and what he needs help with. Remember, guys, Proverbs 12, 15, it says, The way of a fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Fools don't seek and don't follow advice, okay? That's, that's what a fool does. A fool keeps pushing after something, pushing after, striving after something when everybody around them is shaking their head. But the wise yield to correction. A fool can't conceive that somebody outside of their own life might have an accurate assessment of their life. But the wise realize that they have blind spots in their character. A fool pretends at humility by seeking advice with no intention of implementing that advice whatsoever. But the wise seek input, and they put that input into practice quickly. A fool will not even consider getting advice on the things that matter the most to them. But the wise will seek the most input on the things that matter the most to them. Do you guys kind of see the difference here? between a wise mindset, a foolish mindset. I'm telling you guys, like, if you want to be self-aware, seeking advice, it's an arrow that you got to have in your quiver. Like, it's, it's one of the quickest ways to become self-aware. Church, we have, uh, we have the Word of God that can help us be self-aware. We have brothers and sisters in this room who can help us be self-aware. We've got the Holy Spirit living inside of us who corrects us, who, who holds us accountable, who encourages us and helps us to be self-aware as well. God's plan is that none of us here are fools. God's plan is that none of us in here are unaware of ourselves. In fact, the plan is that we can be a wise people that change and alter the world around us with the wisdom that God has given us. So don't be a fool. Remember, a fool does not know that they are a fool. The first step in this series we're doing in April is to find out if you're being a fool. And you can do that by being desperate for self-awareness, by keeping wise company, and by seeking input on your life. Amen? Amen. All right, let's, uh, let's say a quick prayer before Alex gives us some announcements. All right, dear Jesus, thank you so much for a beautiful morning. Um, God, we're, we're so grateful to be able to be here this morning to worship you. I, I love the communion. I love the, the contribution and the welcome, God, and just the music. I'm so grateful for everybody getting here early to serve and help set up. 
we, we have an amazing group of people, God, in this room. And uh, I pray that you help us to be wise. I pray that you help us to, to take these lessons to heart. I think this series might be a little bit hard at times for us, but I think it's going to help us to shine like a city on a hill. God, we love you. I, I pray that you bring so many people out from Aurora in the weeks and the months to come. And God, we can just love up on them and introduce them to this family. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.